If you haven't heard the name Andrew Lilly in jazz circles, chances are that you kind of moved into Cape Town recently. <laughs> He's in the studio with me. Uh, we're going to talk about, I think, the, the well-being of jazz. We're going to talk about an illustrious career, one of the foremost exponents of the piano uh, and he's also teaching now at the University of Cape Town I think the students there are going to benefit from 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 his presence so we bring a bit of a jazzy touch today uh, you may be acquainted with his music maybe not maybe you've read some of his literary work the musical artistry of Beckham Seleko being one such work well today you're going to find out all you'll need to know about Andrew Lilly welcome Andrew hi welcome no, thanks Clarence do you ever lose your energy does age take its toll on jazz musicians because i i just noticed that jazz musicians live for forever yeah no it does it doesn't take its toll it just changes i think as you get older definitely you know your perspective what changes well maybe less inclined to carry huge amounts of equipment to <laughs> to wedding gigs <laughs> and sure. more more maturity in the exploration of the art maybe uh less less preoccupation with needing to play gigs so much, but more, you know, realizing you're running a bit short of time and that you need to explore your your artistic endeavors but your more rigorously. But your artistic yeah. endeavors in this particular art form is required at every gig. Yes, they are. Uh, perhaps less at wedding gigs. Than <laughs> yeah, of course. You've got um, a repertoire yeah, yeah. No, that but has been decided right. by the wife. No, you're absolutely right, yeah. So uh, I think it, it, you, you definitely sort of wind down in terms of the physical enthusiasm, but uh, not in terms of your artistic... Yeah, you do less, but yeah. you do less equally. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. I, I wanted to to know, because I, I, both your parents were um, uh, classically trained, yeah. uh, and you started off your musical career um, there as well. What made you take the leap? Well, that's an, always an interesting question. I think, look, I was surrounded by, by orchestral musicians, and my dad also played in the, in the what of, would have been the swing band, so he played a lot of jazz music. He loved jazz music, but all from the swing period. But, um, I, I mean, so I was a classically trained musician. I didn't really know anything other than that. That environment informed my, my sort of um, explorations as a child. But I, the, the, the burning question for me is always, um, you know, in your DNA, how do you know intuitively what you like and what you don't like and what informs that? So, so at some point in my life, I began to encounter music. And I find myself becoming more attracted to it. So soul music, for instance, which has a lot of jazz in it. And then being, you know, gravitating more towards listening to people in and around the, 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 my, you know, my life at that time, people like Winston Mankuku. I suddenly just find myself being attracted to that music. What draws you to that is a burning question, you know, your DNA or maybe your surroundings. But uh, that led me to explore music in a different kind of way and eventually led me, you know, I just remember one day hearing a pivotal recording of Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock and just going, that's what I like. That's, that is it. That's what I want. That's what I want. And so I would look for that. And then when I'd hear Chris Schilder playing and I'd hear little bits of Herbie Hancock or Bill Evans, I'd think, okay, I need to watch this guy. I need to look at, you know, mm. and so, so you kind of explore that which you're intuitively attracted to. Yeah, I often yeah. ask uh, musicians, jazz musicians like yourself, whether they regret that moment. And inevitably, they'll talk about that moment similarly to the way that you've just spoken about it. And it's always like a uh, light and shade kind of answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I regret it, but I love it. Yeah, it is, it is a bit of both. Yeah, I mean, I always I try to... Um, um, take a profession in architecture you know so i studied okay. architecture which would have been that so moment. you could pay the bills yeah but but <laughs> I, but sanity. I, I ended up gravitating towards music i think it, it's what i knew and what i wanted yeah so yeah but you uh, could have been a wealthy man with other choices basically well i realized architecture was no better <laughs> music it's basically the same except yes. your creative work is left standing for all to see all the time that's correct you know whereas music's very tangible yeah yeah but it doesn't so, pay well no especially not jazz no, not great. See, there's no regrets. It's yeah. about the same as it paid in the 90s, I think. Same. <laughs> yeah, that's a change. The same rate. And in fact, it's post-COVID. Maybe we're yeah. going back to the 80s now. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough life. There's not a lot of venues. Back in the day, you were, you were playing all over the place. You yeah. were playing in townships. You were playing in, in clubs uh, when other people were scared to go into, into that kind of space. You, you, you talk about your encounter with Mong Kung Ku. Was it a serendipitous moment or was it a plan moment? Uh, 
I sort of st- we I, I guess in that environment, you know, when you get into the jazz scene, it's a it's a it's its own network, and so it, it sort of crossed all the boundaries of the savagery of apartheid, and a lot of the and a lot of the you know I feel a bit like the the uh, the boy in the striped pajamas, you know, in, in making friends with people across this barrier was at at a young age it, I, I wasn't so much aware of it so I was you know I ended up working with Winston by virtue of of being sort of friends indirectly with people that he was connected to people like Mike Perry or Mike Campbell and um and and yeah so you just sort of get involved with people and and there seemed to be a lot of more freedom in that at that period in in terms of that engagement because of a common sort of you know a common position in terms of your music rather than now which is kind of weird so i was working it's true, yeah and there actually. were there were a lot of more of a sort of bohemian gig scene there yeah. you know i was thinking of places like rosies and yeah. even the dolphin to an extent but manenbergs and so so i used to i mean it was there didn't seem to be questions asked like a richard pickett that great drummer you remember oh, yeah. richard he would just say to me, "I'd see him in Manenberg office." Yeah, Monty you know, Tony. Weaver. He said to me once, like, "Tony Shoulder can't play at at, at uh, Montreal. You know, will you do the gig?" And I was like, "Yes, I've seen okay." You I've seen you at the no. Galaxy. I've seen you at the Space Odyssey with no, Basil ex- Manenberg could see. Yes, exactly. So That's you crazy. just took yeah, what you take. Yeah, you just yeah. take everything. Yeah. Well, you were crazy back then. Yeah, no, I was. Are you still crazy? You're still. Yeah. I'm crazy, but I leave that part. You got a lid on it when I go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Um, you know, we celebrate w- what we think is 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 a is a unique uh, um, contribution to the genre in terms of Cape jazz. Is 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 that uh, is is that a, a something to celebrate? Absolutely, yeah, I think so. I think that you know that you're always in jazz. I mean, jazz is a language. You know, we know it's an African American art form, but we're always seeking a unique identity and unique voice in the genre f- for ourselves as individuals and so as a collective. You know, living in mm. Cape Town, growing up in Cape Town with its own unique influences, as well as the influences of, of you know, global influences. We come across characters like Winnie or, or you know, Abdullah Ibrahim, and they start to begin to define a unique identity within a community. And so that in self, re, you know, that begins to reinforce itself. You know, the fact that Abdullah sort of modeled himself on Duke Ellington or Winston on Coltrane and Wayne Shorter, mm. Is is neither neither here nor there. Those oh. were his influences, but also his influences were his environment, and yes. so that unique identity is unique to Mankuku. And so then somebody like Buddy Wells, great saxophone player that you know well, would find himself gravitating to Winston's style and maybe taking something from Winston and then furthering moving with that identity. And so it forms its own sort of collective, community-based identity within an overall yeah. genre like jazz. Yeah. I think some of the exponents, and thinking Basil Manabur could see maybe Robbie Jansen, you've played with both of yeah. them. I mean, I think you were there, Basil, very angry with white people, whatever yes, yeah. it meant to him. And I was like, hey, there are white people in your bed. <laughs> what white people are you yeah. referring to? Oh, no. You know, there was, there was a lot of anger that drove a lot of expression back in the day. How did you relate to that kind of anger? You know, um, I mean, look, I, I I don't like getting into that story, but I mean, I was, you know, bound on the other side of the fence. You know, I was required to go to the army and do all that. You know, I, I wasn't a, 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 a great contribution to the SADF, <laughs> I must confess. <laughs> I don't I was think more any jazz a, musician yeah, could be. Yeah, but we, you know, we also had... Uh, you know, so it was very difficult. I mean, my good friend Daryl Andrews, you oh. know, we used to work together a lot, and he lived in Woodstock in those sort of grey areas, and we'd have to play, you know, sort of, uh, we'd have to play around when the police were moving oh. around there. They'd, he'd often get chased out of his house, and I mean, it was it was weird. But then I also had friends who would play across the colour barriers, where they they would be able to find advantage to stay in one area because they were deemed to be white. Yeah. But and yet, then there's Mankunku who yeah. played behind a curtain. Yes, exactly. Because you weren't allowed like to I have said, a so-called mixed race band. Yeah, I think that the the yeah, I think that the overall community of of the musicians together seemed to override the complexity of that, and we were all sort of in a common space. And I didn't get, I didn't feel any aggression. I mean, when I played with Robbie Johnson, I didn't feel. Because he would play and I would play, and, and if we if we resonated on the you were one on the stage. Yeah, if we resonated, then that kind of crossed any barriers, you know. Yeah. Then we could deal with the other stuff. But it's know? that picture 
Yeah. You know, that for me was nearly irreconcilable. And especially Basil Manabug could see yeah, would yeah. be very vocal. Yes. Um, yeah. In front of a big audience in the gardens, he, yeah. he really lambasted all white people and part of his band was white. And I couldn't reconcile it. Yeah. Um, and that was always the interesting little picture that he chose these people to speak maybe his pain. And he wasn't worried about the color of their skin, but he's he was talking about something that I couldn't reconcile in terms of the picture yeah. and the language that he was using to bring it through to, I don't know if it makes sense, but yeah, I yeah. think it was a very important moment in, in my life. Um, I wanted to ask about teaching jazz and, and people that have organically kind of grown into into the genre, people that have found every single sound that the instruments can make through pure dedication and and passion of course people that have gone through music school that you teach um is is the one better than the other is there a difference between the two um i think there is a distinct difference between sort of the in intellectual exploration of music and the organic exploration of music so the organic is is the intuitive attraction to music the desire to want to learn something intuitively and to be attracted to to want to be uh, through mentorship, you know, through, you know, to be some like somebody else. So you're learning because you want to intuitively, whereas the intellectual aspect is really instructional. It, it seeks to dissect the music into, into uh, sort of taught elements which can be instructed and learnt. So I think, I think the one feeds into the other. Even the intuitive learner would be asking questions, and in asking questions they begin to frame things intellectually. And so that intellectual framework informs the way the university kind of delivers its, its, its education. But I think the, the two need to meet in the center. And so without one or without the other, you, 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 you can't really advance. So if it's too much of the, of the organic and not enough intellectual sort of cognitive um, thinking, you know, in, in term, or intervention in terms of the learning process, you don't, you don't move beyond a certain point. So I think that, uh, yeah, so I think at the university, the compromise is that you want to encourage that more in the structured, structured system of the university. I find myself more and more encouraging the musical aspect of it, which is really this, the university of the street, yeah. you know, which we, which we try to. But the university is a good environment to have a network where, where the students can hang out and, and explore. And explore, mm -hmm. exactly. So they get that and they also get a little bit of the, the intellectual thinking, but perhaps not too much enough to interfere with the organic process. So uh, I can go on chatting with Andrew Lilly, one of the foremost exponents of, of course, the piano in the city and now teacher director of music um, at um, at UCT's uh, music school as well. Lekker to have you. Thank you. Go and check out his music. In the meantime, nearly time to say goodbye at 12.